is that John Lee says, when you start meditating, you have to be alert to two things. One is the breath, and the other is the mind. Is the mind staying with the breath? And how is the breath going? Is it tense? Is it tight? Does it feel constricted? If it does, think of it opening up. Experiment for a while to see what kind of breathing feels good. If there's any tension or tightness in any part of the body, think of the breath going right through, dissolving it away. As for the mind, keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't wander off. And it's wandering off, you find, has some stages. There'll be the stage at which it's beginning to think about wandering off but hasn't yet decided. And then part of the mind has decided that it's going to go with the first opportunity it gets. And a lot of that activity is underground. And so you want to be able to see it. Because otherwise you'll suddenly find yourself off in Illinois someplace. Saskatchewan. Or places even worse than that. And you don't know how you got there. So you bring yourself back. And you make up your mind that the next time you're going to be a little bit more alert to the signs that let you know the mind is planning to go off. And as long as there's work to be done with the breath, you have to keep up this double focus. Breath on the one side, mind on the other. Because it's actually the mind that we're trying to get here. The breath is basically bait. If you can work with the breath in a way that feels comfortable, the mind's going to be more willing to stay in the present moment. And if you can get that comfort to spread around so that the whole body feels saturated, the mind will be happy to stay here. It'll settle in. It won't be tensed up, ready to go, jumping off at the slightest pretext. And when that happens, then the breath gets more and more still. And to find it's just the stillness of the breath plus the mind. And you can focus all your attention on what's going on in the mind. And at that point, there shouldn't be much going on in the mind, just awareness, say, of the stillness of the body. And you begin to sense the body is turning into a, a mist of sensations, and the sense of where the surface of the body is, or the boundary of the body is, that begins to dissolve away. And then you can focus on the, the space between those sensation dots, those sensation droplets, and then you're with space. And you realize the space is both in the body and spreads out in all directions. Then we can stay with that perception. You realize, okay, it is a perception that holds you there. You can shift the perception to just the knowing. What is it that knows the space? And you're looking right at awareness. Now this awareness is conditioned, but it's the closest you're going to get to seeing the mind in and of its, on its own, and having a sense of your awareness being separate from other things. This is a very useful perception to have. When pains come up, when unpleasant things come up, you can just stay with the awareness. They're there, you're aware of them, but you're not rushing into them. This is a really useful skill to have while you're meditating and as you go through life. A lot is said about bringing your meditation into daily life, and the skills of meditation are not meant to be practiced only while you're sitting here with your eyes closed. You want to be able to get some control and being aware of the body and aware of your mind wherever you go. This Double alertness is something you want to take with you wherever you go. An important part of bringing meditation into daily life is bringing meditation into daily death. Death is very normal. That that chat we have that we repeat regularly. I'm subject to aging, subject to illness, something subject to death. It's unavoidable. In Thai, they translate that as aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. These things are happening all the time. And one of the Buddha's 
gifts as a teacher as to how to deal with the fact that death is coming. He says you have to be ready for it all the time. His reasoning for staying in the present moment is not because the present present moment is such a great place to be, <coughs> but it's because this is where the work is to be done, so that when death comes you're ready for it. You're not going to be knocked off. So part of bringing meditation in daily life is, is that just that. Remember, you're also developing the skills you need when you die. Because the Buddha realized as part of his awakening that the activity of the mind doesn't need the, act, the existence of the body in order to keep on being active. This is craving in and of itself is enough to sustain your awareness. That's an important insight, and this is why the first verse in the Dhammapada is that the mind is the forerunner of all things. In other words, the mind, your awareness, is not just the side effect of physical events in the body. It's actually the mind that's driving things. Which means, of course, that when the body dies, the, the mind doesn't have to Die. In fact, it doesn't. Its craving keeps going, going, going. So at first, what the Buddha says, with craving as our companions, we keep on going. So at the very least, you want to have a craving that goes in the right direction. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to get our cravings under control, get our desires under control, because desire is an important part of the practice. If you didn't have the, practice, the desire to practice, you wouldn't be here right now. You'd be off someplace else. If you didn't want to put it into suffering, you wouldn't practice. But the Buddha says, okay, let's take that desire and focus in the right direction, i.e. looking at the causes for suffering, so that you want to abandon unskillful qualities and you want to give rise to skillful ones in their place. In other words, you learn how to focus on the causes. And then you want to make up your mind to go in a good direction. If you have to leave the body, you want to go someplace where you can still practice. And so some of the skills you learn as you're working here with the breath, even though the breath will stop at that point, the skills you've learned with the mind. One is being alert to what's going on in the mind. Because as the breath gets more and more still, the mind opens up. It's like bringing light into the entire house, areas that used to be down in the basement, down in the dark running things behind the scenes. You've brought light into the basement. You can see what's happening. So that you're less likely to be waylaid by distractions. Because at that point, the mind will have some choices where it's going to stay. If you can stay with that sense of just knowing, 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 then you can look at what's coming up in the mind, the various, what the Buddha calls, states of becoming, where you could go. Then you can realize, okay, some of them are not desirable. They're not going to be good for the practice. Make up your mind, if I have to go, I'll go only someplace where it's possible to keep on practicing. The deva levels and the human levels, those are the ones where it's possible to practice. And that sense of having this awareness, which is something separate, that allows you to step back from the things that come up in the mind that would otherwise lead you away. So the skills we're developing here are useful not only for getting your mind under control as you go through normal events of daily life, or the usual events of daily life. And also prepare you for the other normal event, i.e. death. And also prepare you for how you can handle aging and illness. When illness comes, you learn how not to focus on the pain. This is one of the big skills you have to develop as you're focusing on the breath. Because all too often we define our sense of the body by the pains that tell us, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. It even gets to the point where we use the pains to breathe, which is a huge mistake. You have to look for where in the body right now, in your sense of the body, is there a feeling of openness, ease, where things are okay. And you'll be amazed to realize how much 
your mind blots those things out when there's pain someplace. You have to learn how to open them back up again. They may not seem especially impressive, but they're there. And you can use them as a safe place to stay. And think of the breath as being totally independent. Think of it being prior to the pain. When the Buddha lists the factors of dependent core arising, the breath is way down there toward the beginning. It's part of fabrication, which is right after ignorance. Well, what we're doing is trying to bring knowledge to that. But it means the breath is prior to feelings. It's prior to our sense of the solidity of the body. So try to get back to this prior element, this prior property. And that liberates it from the constrictions that would come from trying to squeeze the breath into areas that feel really solid or dense or painful. Think of the breath as prior. And think of your awareness as prior to the breath. So you don't have to be afraid that when the body goes, that the awareness is going to go with it. The activities of the mind, as long as there's craving, will keep on going. And when there's no craving, then everything is liberated. It goes beyond space and time entirely. But before you get to that point where there is no craving, you've got to learn how to train your cravings, which is what meditation practice is all about. We don't just follow the mind wherever it wants to go. We make up our mind we're going to stay with one thing and learn how to relate to it in a way that makes it easier and easier to stay. In this case, it's the breath. And anything else that comes up, you say, that's not, that's not what is wanted right now. That's why pains can come, but you're not overwhelmed by them. The pleasure of meditation comes and you learn how to maintain your focus. The Buddha talks about being developed, as he says, in body and mind. Being developed in body doesn't mean you go out and you lift weights. What it means is that you are able to overcome pain. In other words, pain can be there in the body, but you're not waylaid by it. And to be developed in mind doesn't mean you're not overcome by pleasure. That's one of the problems when you meditate is the breath gets more and more comfortable, so you tend to lose your focus on the breath and it shifts over to the pleasure. But you learn how to fight that. Because if you do that, then things begin to blur out. It's pleasant, it's nice, it's still. But there's not much alertness and there's not much mindfulness. And it's alertness that you're really going to need as you go through daily life, as you go through daily death. You want to be really alert to what's going on. And if a state of pleasure comes in, you don't want to be waylaid by it. Pain comes in, you don't want to be waylaid. You want to have your wits about you. Because there are some pleasant rebirths where you don't have any opportunity to practice at all. The formless states are totally out of communication with everybody else. So you want to make sure that you are not waylaid by pleasure, just as you're not waylaid by pain. So there are a lot of really important skills that you learn here as you meditate, which, as everybody knows, are useful in daily life, but also come in really handy when death comes. This way the Buddha provides protection all around, a refuge as you're breathing and a refuge when the body stops breathing. He doesn't abandon you. He provides you with the skills you need all the way. So try to bring the practice into your daily life. Get used to being with the breath. Get used to having this sense of double alertness, being with the body, and also keeping track of where the mind is going. Because that particular skill will take you a very long way. <laughs>